Okay, good morning, everyone. Today will be our third Stat Cafe session, and our speaker is Dr. Sofasini Subarao. She did her PhD in the University of Bristol, and then she did her postdoc at the University of Heidelberg, and then joined our department. And right now, she's a professor at our department. She's doing her research in time series analysis and published in top tier journals. So, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the talk. So, so, I always start with a moral, okay? I mean, you don't, I don't care whether you learn that time series. Hopefully you will a little bit in my talk, but I want to introduce you to um, my, my friend, Sally, right? And this is an amazing turtle, right? Two years ago, she's, she's, she's like really cute. She started out, let me see this. She started out in the Gulf of Mexico two years ago and then paddled her all her way up to Europe, this place called Wales. Which is, uh, which is the United Kingdom up there. And it was rather cold up there, right? You know, Gulf of Mexico is where we are. It's kind of warm and it went all the way up there. It was really, really cold. Um, and when she survived and that was two years ago in December and people on the beach found her and then went through a two year rehabilitation up there in Wales. And recently, and, and the, this is um, an A&M initiative or sort of a multinational initiative, but she got like, blown back to the Gulf of Mexico and last week she was finally released back into um back in, in back into the Gulf um and and the reason I mean we love turtles right because we see them even in College Station but she's a Kent Ridley turtle and um and this is one of the endangered turtles out there um I think a few years ago they well about 30 years ago they realized there was only a couple of thousand in the population and so they've started like huge schemes actually A&M is um, our our sort of a &M in Galveston is one of the, the big in, um, big organizations out there who are trying to regrow this turtle. Um, and what, how is it related to us? Well, and this is my, you know, my soapbox that I'm getting onto. Um, one thing I, one thing it does relate to us is that there are microplastics in the ocean, right? These like tiny plastics and they come from us. Um, and one of these microplastics is because we use too much plastic, right? So uh, my soapbox is that all of us can help and help little, little, little um, tally out here by using less plastic and dumping it. Basically, what's happening is all that plastic you get is dumped into the ground. That's what's happening to it. And then it goes into the ocean and it hurts my little friend Tally. OK, so just remember, we need to help Tally. OK, OK, so that's my soapbox. And, and I hope you like my friend out here. But my talk is on time series and graphical models, multivariate time series in particular. Um, it's sort of semi-technical, but I really try to make any of my talks not that technical. And I'm really going to start, I hope, at least I hope, but my students always tell me I don't do this, from bottom up. So I don't expect any real background knowledge, but hopefully you'll get sort of the spirit of actually what's happening in this whole thing. OK, so let's start with an example out here. Um, this is a time series, so data observed over over like a, a, a thousand time points. It's synthetic data, so basically data I mess, I made it myself to sort of prove a point. I would say, um, and it's multivariate, so it's four time series running concurrently together. Um, and when you look at them, they're different. They're not the same time series, but there are two things that you can actually see. So first is that you can see that they're sort of moving together, right? So that suggests a sort of form of correlation between the time series, a form of dependence and kind of linear dependence in the time series. The other thing you notice, and it's notion of stationarity, and I'll talk about that in more detail later on, but if you visually look, the sort of, if you're an econometrician, you say the volatility or the variation here is very different to the variation out here, right? And so that's basically telling us that, that there's a non-stationarity. Stationarity assumes that in some sense, the variation or the changes are roughly the same over time, so we see two things in this in these time series. First, there's correlation between the time series, and secondly, there is sort of um, a sort of what we call non-stationarity within the time series, and even more between the time series. Okay, um, and we can formalize all these notions and and statistically test for it. So we can test the null. There's no correlation. In the alternative, there is correlation. And also we can test the null that there is stationarity, like similar behavior over time against the alternative that the behavior is somehow changing over time. OK, um, but the thing about this is that somehow when you see the data, it's kind of obvious, right? So you don't actually have to test 
this, it's kind of absolutely clear that if you do any of these tests, if the test is any good, you're going to get an extremely tiny p-value. So it doesn't really inform us on, on, the, on the data. You might ask a sort of more subtle question. You might ask yourself, okay, so suppose I move away from like pairwise relationships, like are these two time series correlated? You might ask us what we call system-wide or, or conditional relationships, which asks, okay, is there still correlation between these two time series when I remove all the dependence on the other time series? Okay, so that's something you might ask yourself. So it's what we call a conditional type of relationship. And you might also ask in this more subtle notion, is there still a stationarity if I remove the dependence on the other? So these are the things that you kind of think about a little bit when you see sort of whole bunch of time series come together. If we're moving away from what we say pairwise relationship and want to look at more conditional relationships, we are now sort of in the realm of GGM, so Gaussian graphical models. So what I want to do is spend a little bit of time explaining to you, if you have no background on this, and the majority of you seem to be um, sort of, you know, PhD students, but I do want to sort of make it easy, explain what GGM is in simple words, right? And, and how, how, we, how we construct what we call graphs using the G GGM paradigm. So let's start basic, okay? We start with a random vector X of dimension P, okay? And we're assuming it's Gaussian for now. That just makes things a little bit easier when we, we talk about conditional relationships. And it has a, a variance matrix sigma, and this will play a role later, but not at the very beginning. And in order to define a graph, we need an edge set. I mean, sorry, we need a vertex set or a node set and an edge set. And that's basically telling us, the edge set is telling us, like, are we going to have a connection between two nodes? And we need a rule for that, okay? The uh, vertex set is depends upon, it, it's, 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 it's linked to the number of, um, um, the, 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 the dimension of the time series. So in the case, if P is equal to three, over here, we'd have one, two, and three out here. Okay, and then we need a rule to determine whether we're gonna put an edge between, between the nodes. And in the GGM paradigm, we do it by looking at conditional relationships. So the way we do that is we define another vector X, which is dependent on the vector, this X over here, but basically says it's the vector X here, but I'm removing um, the um, random variable xa and the random variable xb. Okay, so this is a subset of this vector with xa and xb removed. Okay, <laughs> now when you define a conditional graph, you basically say, is there a correlation between the random variable a and the random variable b? And this is important to me after conditioning out all the other random variables. And if that correlation or covariance, the same thing, is zero, we do not put an edge between them. But if it's not zero, we put an edge. So you might have a graph that looks like this, and this is basically saying one and two are connected to each other. So basically, one um, variable one and one and two, because even after conditioning on three, they are still a correlation. But one and three are not correlated, not dependent on each other, because after conditioning on two, that correlation has gone away. Okay, so that's how we define the graph or a, a, a sort of a graph um, in, the, in the GGM world. Okay, um, now that's the graph. The question is, how do we do the estimation? And the estimation is typically done using what we call um, and the precision matrix and the precision matrix. So right now it seems a bit sort of convoluted, but is the inverse of the variance matrix. So you get the variance matrix, you invert that quantity, and we have what is known as the precision matrix. So this is a P by P matrix over here. So the inverse is going to be another P by P matrix. And there's a nice result. It's very easy to prove. And I'm going to show you in a second what that is. Is it that the entry, for example, if this entry here is zero, this entry here is zero if and only if there is no conditional dependence between the random variable x1 and the random variable x2, okay? So basically what you're doing is if, if you can, this is how you would do it, if you can actually um, estimate the precision matrix and then try and test whether you know entries in that precision matrix are zero or not, you're basically testing whether there's an edge between two, um, two nodes or not. Does that make sense, right? Okay, now the, here is where sort of the sort of the multivariate analysis comes on. Why is this true? And there are many, many proofs of this, but I'm going to show you 
one sort of simple proof for why this result is true, because it's going to help us in our understanding of what happens in the time series case. OK, so let's go to this is the variance I had to do in tiny font in LaTeX, right? But this is the variance between x1 and x2. So here, a is equal to 1 and b is equal to 2. So it's the variance between x1 and x2 after conditioning out all the other uh, um, other uh, random variables over here. So this is going to be a two by two matrix, okay? Because it's Gaussian, we know again from multivariate analysis that the conditional variance of that is going to be this quantity over here, right? If we're not doing the conditioning, then this quantity wouldn't be there. If we're, this, we're not conditioning, then the variance of X1 and X2 is simply, um, simply this matrix over here. But if we do the conditioning, then we're actually subtracting this term out here. So well and good. That's what we normally learn in class. But there's also this thing called sure complement, which shows that this quantity here is in fact the inverse of the position matrix of this inverted. Okay, so that's just a result that I just wanted you to know. Okay, so you go to Wikipedia, they'll, you'll get the proof. Okay, so that's the result that these two are equivalent. Okay, but this, the equivalence between this and this this sort of inverse of the submatrix, the position matrix, basically explains why zeros in here um, co 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 um, co um, correspond to zeros in the conditional correlation, right? Because if you think about it, the covariance between x1 and x2, conditional on everything else, is simply the off diagonal in this matrix out here, right? And so this is going to be the inverse of this two by two matrix at the off diagonal. Okay, now we all know, and even I can invert a two by two matrix just about, that if this is a diagonal matrix, I mean, if this is zero and this is zero, and I invert it, I'm going to get a diagonal matrix again. And so that tells us that the off diagonal of this, if that, uh, if, sorry, if this is zero, this quantity is zero, then, then that means the conditional variance between x1 and x2 is zero. Does that make sense, right? So I hope that's kind of clear to everyone, all right? So <laughs> we can, so this sort of simple result clearly tells a simple and very classical result. Tells us how the position matrix, entries and position matrix, um, sort of correspond to conditional correlation or conditional variance over here. Another thing that I'll come to later on, if I get time to talk about estimation over here, is that, so we, what we have is this conditional covariance, notion of conditional covariance. Then we have this notion of precision matrix, and then regression comes into play. Okay, so the way, one way of estimating this position matrix out here is to do, you basically use regression, okay? You can basically regress one, all the variables here onto this variable out here. So basically we can regress X2 to X, XP onto X1 and the coefficients of that regression basically correspond to the entries in this precision matrix, okay? So this allows us, just using tools of linear regression, allows us now to start estimate the entries in the precision matrix. Okay, so again, classical results, but useful when we want to start determining um, the, the, the GGM graph. Okay, so this is classical, no time series involved right here, right? So what we want to now go is to the time series setting. So we're going to start off with a p-dimensional time series, okay? And we're assuming it's stationary. So I'm going to now so precisely define what I mean by stationary here. For my convenience, I'm assuming that there's no mean. This whole time series, there's no mean in this time series. And by stationality, I'm saying that the covariance between xt, so the random variable vector at xt, and x tau, that covariance is going to be a, t by, a p by p matrix over here, is indexed by t minus tau. Okay, it doesn't depend upon t and tau separately. It depends upon the lag. So this notion of covariance, if you're not familiar with like time series or spatial statistics or anything else, it's saying like, okay, I have an observation at time point t and I have an observation at time point tau and I want to measure the covariance between those two. That covariance doesn't depend upon these specific time points at all. All it, it, all it depends upon is the lag difference. Okay, and, and usually you can imagine as that lag difference grows, this relationship declines. Okay, so that's kind of what covariance is. So this is kind of important to us, and covariance stationarity is a quite an important, important notion here. Okay, now, if I were to sort of blindly apply GGM to a time series, okay, I would just be looking at the variance matrix of XT itself. So I'd be looking at 
the variance of xt, which is a, it, a, an inverting that, and that's a precision matrix. And it would be basically the inverse of the, what we call the contemporaneous variance. So just looking at the variance at time point t and inverting and looking for zeros in that. Now, that has some information, but it's only looking at correlations at a given time point, okay? It's not taking into account correlations between one time series, a time series, say, at time point D and the time series of tau. That's gone away, okay? So you're sort of losing information if you sort of blindly apply GGM to a time series without any much thought, okay? So <laughs> about 20, 20-odd 20 years ago, Rainer Dahlhaus, um, okay, so there's there's a notion of partial covariance in time series, okay? And I'll, I'll define to you that in a second. But Rainer Dahlhaus started using that notion to start constructing um, a graph now for, for stationary time series. So what I want to do is define to you what co um, condition, uh, conditional covariance is for a time series or how, how it's typically defined, and then use that definition now to construct to construct a graph. So that, that's my next aim over here. So let's start with, with the space. Now, if you go back to how um, essentially we define GGM in, in, in just the classical IID world, we had a set X, we, we had a sort of space X, which is basically all the random variables but A and B, okay? And so this would be a, a sort of a P minus two dimensional space, right? If you go to a time series and look at that, Thing, and you want to take into account the, the entire dependent structure, your space gets a little bit bigger. You're sort of interested in the correlation between a time series of A and a time series of B, but removing everything else. So this linear space you need to deal with now, that means the random variables you'll be conditioning on now, has to be all the other time series, okay, not A and B, but also, <laughs> at all time points, because it's a time series, right? So what we have now is our conditioning set is basically XTC, which is the time series at all time points, okay? And all, all, the, all, the, um, all the nodes, I would say, except for A and B, okay? So this is now, now a sort of infinite dimensional. So that's your linear space, and that's what we're going to be conditioning on. So in time series, the partial covariance between x t and x tau at node a and node b um, is defined as covariance between x t and x a and x tau and b after conditioning on this entire set over here. That's the partial covariance. And so Ryan Dahlhaus, when he defined um, the graph, let's go to the case of p is equal to three again. Okay, we have one, two, and three. He said that we should put an, an edge between one and two if the correlation between xt and um, x1 and x2, between x1 and x2 out here, is non-zero for some t and tau, right? So for some lag t and tau, this quantity happens to be non-zero, then we put an edge between those two, okay? But this is quite complicated because now we're, okay, we have to look at t, we have to look, find a t and tau where this is non-zero, right? Um, but that sort of makes sense. Intuitively, this is a sort of a, a sensible generalization of GGM now to the time series setup. And of course, we don't put a, an edge between one and two. If for all T and tau, we have no correlation between one and two. This is zero for all T and tau. Then we don't put an edge between them. Okay, so that's, that's sort of now the sort of classical definition of a Gaussian graphical model in the time series setup. Um, <laughs> The problem is we have a definition. The question is, is how do you do the estimation? That's another story. Um, sure. So if it's stationary, the graph cannot change. Yes. Um, okay. So. All right, so let's look at an application. And this is an application from one of my co-authors, so this is not my paper. So basically what he was looking at is, um, he looked at um, um, ECG data. So if you, were, if you know anything about ECG data, it's a non-invasive procedure where basically you would have like several channels, often 64 channels put on your head. I've been told it's completely tame. In fact, uh, my collaborator has ECGs often 
don't. And he tells me it's completely relaxing. He kind of enjoys the experience almost. Okay. So you have 64 channels on your head and you're sort of sitting there basically. And they ask you to close your eyes, open your eyes. So it was kind of funny because I was I sort of talked to him about ECG data. Um, and I said, I think we're working on another project. I said, we, we should apply it to ECG, EEG data. And then and then after that, he took, took, took a really big interest in the EEG data. So then he actually sent me loads of text when he was getting an EEG done <laughs> during this whole project, right? So basically what he has is like 64 channels. So there's a multivariate time series. The dimension is 64, so quite a large dimension. And what he did, and this is not his data, though he did actually ask them for the data. And they, I did get it, but it was so messy. He couldn't deal with it anymore. So this is sort of clean data from sort of classical data set, where basically, so these are all the nodes. So these are all these sort of different nodes on the brain. And what you're seeing here is the connectivity graph, just basically if the time series shows any form of correlation. So in this case over here, um, like you, it's barely you can see, but these two, for example, this point and this point are connected because at some time point there's correlation. So this is just what we call basically the coherence graph, okay? We're not doing any conditioning here. No conditioning was done in this case over here. He just puts a connection using whatever method if there is some evidence of, of a correlation at some lag between in these two time series over here. And this is a partial coherence graph. And that partial coherence is exactly what I talked to you about, this notion I talked talk to you over here, where you only put a connection now if there's evidence in the data that there's some correlation at some time point between the two time series after conditioning out every other sort of channel, I would say. In, 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 in so now you can see it's a lot sparser, okay? And um, neither of us know anything about EG. So we were just laughing about this whole data set because now we say, okay, it like, looks really good. I think, um, but I, mm -hmm. I can't interpret it. And now I guess this is where the neuroscientists come in and, and sort of try to give you, give us their wisdom on it, but at least it looks nice, right? And it, I hope it illustrates exactly um, uh, what we're aiming for in this whole thing. Okay, now the question is, how do you do the estimation? So it seems really unwieldy, right? You you have like, <laughs> you I mean, you have like, you know, 64, pro, uh, 64 nodes and that's big enough in itself, but let's get that. What you have is a time series is in general, really, really long or infinite dimensional. So how do you find the, the, this correlation at some lag? And, and essentially I will show you later on that this corresponds to estimating huge matrices. Right, so I'm going to show you how all this can be now rewritten in sort of what we call the operator world. But um, it's really, for our understanding, it's just really massive matrices. Okay, um, um, and you can show that, and I will try to explain how you can show that by transforming to another domain, what we call frequency domain. Just just do a transformation to another domain, things become a lot easier. So what happens here is. You can show, if you define what we call the spectral density function, which is essentially a Fourier transform of the covariance, this, this covariance I was talking to you about, um, and you invert it. So this is just a P by P matrix, okay? It's, it's indexed by a frequency. Don't worry about that so much. Don't in, in, in my interpretation over here. This is a P by P matrix um, that sort of, is, uh, that's indexed over frequency, okay? But if you invert this P by P matrix, we have what is called a spectral density matrix. So this is now a P by P matrix. It's always spectral position matrix. And you can show, this is a P by P matrix, if this covariance between, um, the co conditional covariance between X T A and X tau B is, when you do conditioning, is zero for all T and tau. That is zero for, I should have written, for all T and tau, this quantity is zero if and only if, when you invert the spectral density matrix, so we have this precision matrix over here, at that entry A and B, that's zero. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I'm confused. The why I'm thinking about is that I usually the dimension of uh, inverse covariance matrix, and the matrix are there is P by P. So it, everything is in the time domain infinite dimension. This is P by P, right? So forget this. This, if I wanted to not go into the spectral, I'll explain that to you. Forget that, right? I mean, if you think about it, your covariance matrix in time series is not normally talked about, but our covariance matrix in time series is infinite dimension. It's an infinite dimensional object, okay? But if you think about what we're looking at, if we're looking at a time series, which is infinite dimension, and now we look at the variance of that, we, we don't teach students that it's infinite dimensional, but what we do is we have a time series, we treat this as a long vector, okay? Now you look at the covariance of this matrix, you have an infinite dimensional matrix. There, there is an infinite time index. I mean, that's a number. Oh, well, if you have time series of dimension, if it's time series of length n, then and you then you have an n by n matrix. But if you think about in, in if you think about you know in 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 the population level, we observe 
we should, at the population air level, observe the time period from the beginning of time, which was minus infinity, to the end of time, which is infinity, right? So that's a very long time series. Now, if you think about that, it's a very long random vector. Okay, now you take the variance of that object over here from this very long random vector. So you have a very, very big matrix, and that's our covariance matrix. We don't normally say that a variance, we, we find tricks to avoid talking about it, but in reality, we're dealing with a very massive covariance matrix, which we call an operator, right? So that's the kind of way. Okay, so, but you know, nice tricks, which I'll try to explain to you, reduce everything to the spectral world, right? And now all we're dealing with is a P by B matrix. So, so let's not worry about this. I will explain slowly where everything comes into play. Okay, so I'll explain how the precision matrix I talked about earlier is related to this precision matrix out, out here. Okay, this is a bit complicated. And, and this now is using this tool of the spectral density matrix. People have actually started to estimate this graph out here in low dimension. So I told you when low dimension is when the multivariate time series Theories may have dimension three or four or five or six or high dimension. So you think about it here, we have 64 channels. So that, that means if you think about it, any time point, we're observing the, um, a, multi, a multivariate time series, a random vector of dimension 64. And now, of course, you have to use sort of more sort of nuanced tools for trying to use this to, in order to control um, in order to control like the false positives and so forth. So, so things are a bit more complicated, of course, in, in higher dimensions. OK. Now let's go down to what, I'm not sure I'll get any time to talk much about this, but, but what my aim was with my collaborators and what I'm working on right now is to sort of generalize these notions and see whether we can do a little bit more to the non-stationary time series. So let me go back to what stationarity means, right? So we have like a time series at time point T and a time series at time point tau. And I said stationarity means the linear dependence on those two is indexed by t minus tau. It only depends upon the difference in time. Okay, but there is so there's no real reason, at least in many applications, to assume, say, a time series is stationary. The in time index itself may play a role, right? So you could say, okay, if I wanted to, okay, look at the weather. Weather is my classic example. If anyone takes my time series course, I talk about weather non-stop. So my spatial talk, I don't take my time series, right? So. If you think about what weather is like, you look at the weather today and you look at the weather in a few days time, you want to look at the correlation between that. Okay, three weeks ago, when we were really boiling to death, right? I mean, we were in 42, or if you want to say over hundreds, right? Um, we were in a situation where, you know, it was basically 100, 100, 100, 105, you know, that's what, there was really a massive amount of correlation in the time series, you know, between today and tomorrow. Go back to November, go to November, right? Now, this is my favorite month because I like time series, I like looking at data. In November, if you look at the look at the data out there, it's fantastic. There is just this switching between, between temperatures. I'm gonna say it's in Celsius because I, have, I can't do conversion fast enough. We have days when it's 25 degrees Celsius out there. So that's like in the 70s, I would say. And then, I mean, this is like amazing, within a few hours, it goes down to zero, okay, right? Now, the correlation there is clearly very, very different than the correlation like a few weeks ago, right? So the correlation dynamics, this is not depending on T minus tau. The actual time is playing a role in that correlation. You understand that? Right, so, so... You know, so you, you could argue in a lot of time series, at least over the span interval you're observing, this notion of stationarity is a little bit <laughs> too strong. And we have to drop that assumption and look at like, maybe non-stationary world. So our my aim was when I started on this a couple of years ago, is was to now build a parsimonious framework for time series, for multivariate time series, which again, held information about the conditional correlation between time series like if you condition out is there still an edge but also we wanted to we sort of started to put more information in that graph we started to look at whether if i do the conditioning have i lost my station non-stationarity okay and that's what i want to sort of describe to you later so um and again, all this comes down to looking at sort of infidimensional precision matrices. And then we map over 
to the frequency domain, which sounds kind of scary because you've got signs, you've got cosines, and actually you've got complex numbers, but it's just a means of getting information in a sort of more sparser fashion. That's all I want to argue. That's the reason why we change domains in this. Okay, let's start with a sim relatively simple example. So if you go to multivariate time series, um, so the classical model, so everything we're do I'm talking about in this talk is model free, but it's easiest to understand with the model is a VAR model. So this is what we call a vector autoregressive model. It says the time series at time point T is equal to the time series at time point T minus one multiplied by what we call, um, I forget this name, uh, transition matrix, plus here in this case over here, IID, IID noise on top of this. So this is a VAR, a VAR one model over here. Um, <laughs> and if this is IID, um I probably missed out something where 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 my bet two minus one two minus two two one oh yeah 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 so this is a typo that I've never managed to remove right one 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 yeah thank you okay right so thank you for that yes that was my my bad so basically what we have over here is thank you um this if this is iid then this, what we call the transition matrix, determines the graph. And it's quite easy to show, but I don't want to explain really right now why that is. But this transition matrix tells us that essentially the, the graph corresponding to this should be this over here. So it tells us that three and four, after conditioning out one and two, there is no edge between that. Okay? And, and it's sort of easy to show why. It's basically because... Um, and when you take the inner product between this one and this one over here, you get zero. But but this is the math behind it. I don't want you to worry too much about it. So it tells us after conditioning between one and these two over here, um, after conditioning on these two over here, these two are not dependent. But if I didn't do that conditioning, they would be dependent. That's the point. After condition, there's no dependent. The nice thing about these graphs over here, these are undirected graphs. We've got raw arrows everywhere. But the nice thing about these graphs, it tells us something about this structure, not not too much, but it does give us information about this structure out here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just non stationarify this system. Okay, so I'm going to, this is stationary under certain conditions. What I'm going to do is make it non stationary by making a couple of these parameters out here depending upon time. Yes. Um, so you're saying that three and four are not, um, are, are not correlated and it's wrong, right? There is connected. Yeah, so because basically because there is a because well, I'll give it roughly. Because there's a dependence in this whole transition matrix out here. So you shouldn't use this too much as a, a thing, but but because because there's they're also sort of driving each other. They're also sort of moving around each other. There is the direction, I don't want to work, but but because the way this variance matrix is constructed, there is a dependence going on. Um, you should be a little bit careful about saying there is dependence between those three via one and two, but roughly they could argue. Okay. But it's a good question. Okay. So I'm going to non stationify this system, right? So this means that the correlation now doesn't depend in this time series, doesn't depend upon T and tau separately, only depends on the lag T minus tau. I'm non stationified by just making a couple of the variables time dependent. Okay, how I've made it time doesn't really matter too much. I've made alpha t time dependent and gamma t time dependent. So now this is our transition matrix. And, and then what we get is now essentially what I showed you at the beginning of class, right? So you can see that everything is non-stationary. So first thing is you see everything is non-stationary. Everything seems to be correlated to each other, exactly what Connor asked out there. Um, but when you look at that transition matrix, you sort of get a feeling that I would say two and four, these two time series, they are correlated, but they're sort of inheriting maybe the dependence from the other time series, right? So there is a sort of a driver and a receiver maybe. And if you look at it, here you can't see it, but the transition matrix suggests maybe that one and three are driving the non-stationarity in the system, okay? So really what I want to do is and then if you sit down and you work out, sit down with these precision matrices out there, you can't do a spectral density matrix anymore, but if you sit down with precision matrices, you can actually show that the graph corresponding to this network here, 
is this graph. And if you made these two time dependent over here, the actual, if you, you and use exactly the same definition that two nodes, um, we're going to put an edge between two nodes if we condition out everything else. And if that's zero, we don't put an edge. If that's non zero at some time point T and tau, then we put an edge. You can show that the con this thing over here <coughs> is going to have this graph too. So they share the same graph based upon the definition I've just given to you. But the problem is that they're, same, they're the same. So when you just look at the graph and don't look at the transition matrix or don't look at the time series, they don't tell us whether the underlying time series is stationary or not. So they give us no information about the, the state of the time series. Does that make any sense? Same graph, completely different time series, okay? So what we wanted to do is have a graph in a non-stationary setup which contains more information that gives us an information that the, that the actual underlying graph is non-stationary and sort of the, not only whether, not only the relationship between two nodes, whether it's zero or not, but what that relationship is. Okay, so well, this is, I, I, I don't know whether it's technical or not technical, I hope it's not. Okay, so we start, this is our definition of the graph. Okay, and then I'll show you what it is for, for the dummy example I've just given to you. We start off say with, a and B and C, for example. And the idea is just as in, um, in as in times a, a stationary time series, we put an edge between A and B. If after conditioning on time series C, there's some sort of correlation between A and B. Okay. But if there's no correlation between A and B after conditioning on C, we don't put an edge. That's the first rule. The next is now a new rule. We say, okay, we, oh, I should remove the circles a little bit. There we are, there we are, and there we are. The next bit is, I would put a circle around A and B. This is sort of, a, sort of a, like, I would say, potentially new session over there. I'm gonna put just a sort of solid line around A. If the correlation between X T and X tau of A, it's, it's a multi, it's a long time series. So if there's a correlation between X T and X tau, after conditioning on everything else, if that correlation is a function of just t minus tau, so it's do you see it just it's just a function of t minus tau, not a function of t and tau separately, then I put a solid edge between it. So this somehow is conditionally stationary. It tells us something interesting. It tells us the time series A on its own is non-stationary. So you looked at the time series A and you looked at the covariance structure over time, that depends upon t and tau separately. But if I get the time series A and I condition on everything else, if that now becomes a function of T minus tau separate, I mean, I mean together T minus tau, so there's a lag T minus tau, then it's what we call conditionally stationary, okay? And I put a, a solid edge on it, all right? I can do the same now for between different nodes. I put everything as solid between A, B, and um, A. If now between A, I might have A and B like this. If I have that all this is stationary after conditioning on A, C, all right? So then I say that this is a, like a, or conditioning time invariant. It's a little bit tricky this. I don't want to go too much in the technicalities, but basically this whole system here is stationary after I've done my conditioning, okay? And if things are not stationary, that means T, for example, if I look at A itself and I condition on everything else, and that's still the covariance between XT, so this covariance over here, XT and X tau, this covariance here after conditioning around depends upon T and tau individually, T comma tau, then I make it variegated. Does that make sense? And similarly between edges. Does that sort of make sense? Yes. Uh, I think it makes sense. I have a question regarding the state variance that you were showing, but that you said there would be. Uh... Um, I guess like uh, basically that there was some tau in T for like X A and tau and X B and T for the covariance of uh, zero. And he said that if you can find some T in that, where that works. Uh, in this particular case, it looks like this is really uh, what it should be if there is some T in tau, regardless of the distance. But in the stationary case, I guess, if you could find one T in tau that it holds, that it holds for all T plus row and tau plus row. Yes. 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 So it's the same thing here. Like in, in, the, in the case of non-stationarity, if there is some T and tau where 
it's now a function of t and tau separately, then it's non-stationary. Yeah. Does that mean? Yeah, and then say the same is if the, the, if the t and tau holds for all every t and tau for all times where the difference between the two exactly right. I'm sorry if this is, it's a sort of precisely written, I don't want to sort of make it too kind of too, 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 too. I mean, and I, even I'll be confused yeah, by I, two, no. I just want to get a sense of how stationary is different in the case where like finding one T and how amounts to actually having found many. Yes. Uh, with a different, uh, so I hope this answers your question. All right, so going back to our example back here, this is the graph corresponding to this matrix out here, right? So what we see is that one and three, even one after conditioning on two, four, and three remains non-stationary. Three after conditioning on one, two, and four remains non-stationary. But two after conditioning on one, three, and four is become stationary. So it sort of switches. That so once I do the conditioning, it becomes stationary. Okay, um, and three and four, there's no connection between it, like in the stationary case, um, that tells us basically there's no correlation between three and four, regardless of stationarity. Right? So that's our graph now in the non-stationary setup. And so that, <clears throat> and might, one might ask what, what the application of this is. One is that given this graph, one could potentially try and build a VAR model. There are sort of result, ways of doing that. The other is, that it sort of tells us in some sense that one and three are driving that non-stationarity system, okay? And, and two and four are like um, sort of inheriting it, okay? So that it gives us in, in, information that might be useful um, from like our OIM that we haven't done this yet because it's quite hard, but we will I hope at some point is apply this to now sort of neuroscience data. That, that's I Yes, Connor. <laughs> I want to make sense of it. So if you remove one of Yes, but you need to condition on one and three, right? After yeah. condition, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. But if you repeat it back in, then you look at all four components of the system. Yeah. Then you have some of those cross variants and Where? variant functions that are now existing on T and tau separately. Okay. Exactly right. So conditioning means that that becomes a function of T minus tau. If you don't do a conditioning, everything is a function of T and tau separately. Okay. All right. Now the question is, is okay, that's the definition. How do we learn it? So I'm going to now explain to you our precision matrix, okay? And um, and then sort of explain how we go into the spectral domain. I'm sorry, am I really boring you to death here? With, with this, does it make sense a little bit, okay? So I'm sorry, this is a bit technical, but I hope not, right? So now, um, <laughs> now Ning Ning asked a really nice question. What do I mean by infinite adventure? So let me explain to you. We have a p-dimensional time series. And if you think about p-dimensional time series, we can write a p-dimensional time series as, the, if you look at the covariance of a two-dimensional time series, this consists of a p by p-dimensional block matrix, where each entry in that block matrix contains the covariance information between, say, in this case over here, one and two, okay? so. C12 contains all the covariances between xt1 and x tau2. Does that make sense? So for all t and tau. So this is why it's infinite dimension. Okay. So this quantity here, if you want to be mathy, is an infinite dimensional operator. But don't worry about that. It's just a massive matrix because it contains all these cross covariances at every t and tau over here. And of course, it has to be p by p because it's a p. Um, dimensional multivariate time series. Okay, so this is our matrix. Now our matrix entries in our matrices, our covariance matrices aren't like singletons, aren't just one value, are just these massive matrices. Okay, um, and the central assumption that we're dealing with here, this is our underlying assumption, is that if you work out the eigenvalues of this matrix out here, which you can, um, well, at least theoretically, so to speak, is the eigenvalues are bounded away from zero and are bound away from infinity. Okay, and bound away from zero because what we're going to do is invert this object. Okay. Um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to, I told you everything in conditional relationships is not looking at the variance matrix, 
for looking at the precision matrix, which is just inverting the object. And so remember, I'm asking you to treat this just as a regular old variance matrix and asking us to invert it. So I have now a precision matrix, just a very big one. Okay, so I'm going to invert this matrix out here to now get a, a P by P dimensional block matrices where each of the entries in this block matrices just are infinite dimensions. Okay, just don't worry about that. It's going to contain all the conditional relations, covariances in there. But if they're just, <laughs> the entries have just got a bit more complicated, right? That's all that's happened. So what I'm going to show you now is all the conditional covariances I've described to you in terms of the conditional covariance in a time series are encrypted in these quantities out here. Okay. Which you sort of would expect if you're dealing with precision matrix. It's just that normally in time series, we sort of avoid that. Okay. But it's useful for what I'm doing. But it's nothing hard. As long as you know things are working, you can deal with this thing. You can, infinite dimensional matrices, nah, it's the same as a finite dimensional matrix. Just you need certain regularity conditions. Okay. Okay. Now, we, so remember what we learned at the beginning, or what we might have learned at the beginning of this talk, is that the variance matrix in XA and XB, when you condition on everything else, so this is just now unit, the, I'm sorry, the multivariate case, no time series over here, is DAA, DAB, DBA, and DBB inverted, right? Okay, we know that. That's why I just showed you at the beginning. We can show something similar. We can show the conditional variance of XTA given all the other time series. Yeah, but remember it's a time series now. So I'm looking at node A, okay? I'm conditioning out everything else, but node A is a time series going from the beginning of time to the end of time, right? I'm conditioning out everything else. That happens to be this inverse of this entry out here, okay? Similarly, if I now look at the variance between XA and XB, okay? These two time series out here, conditioning out everything else, okay? That turns out to be DAA, DAB, this matrix out here. So just this like this block out here, inverted. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're sort of rewriting conditional relationships now in terms of precision matrices, which makes us understand and everything. It also makes us understand how to estimate these quantities a little bit. Okay, but everything is as before. You see that? We're just doing everything as we did before, but just using big matrices. Okay, so now we can rewrite the definition of the graph I've just stated to you in terms of these big matrices over here. A and B are conditionally correlated if and only if this DAB, this, this just happens to be infinite dimension, but this matrix out here is zero. So entire matrix is zero. A node A is conditionally stationary if only if DAA is topless. I haven't just defined that to you, okay? But it's a very, very special matrix that's used only in, often in time series and also in spatial statistics. The, day, the edge A and B is conditionally invariant that non, the, when you have two things, you condition everything else, if and only if the corresponding DAB matrix is toplets. And basically we have this conditional non-stationarity if these two are non-toplets. So the question is, what's a toplets matrix? And here I have one. Okay, so this is what a toplets matrix is. So it doesn't matter if it's infinite dimensional or finite dimensional, it doesn't make any difference. A toplet matrix is a very simple matrix. It's like our bed and bread and butter in time series. It's basically a matrix that's defined by just one row. Okay, so I get one row, okay? And then the next row is just a shifted version of the first row, okay? That's what a state, uh, sort of a toplet structure looks like, okay? These are very nice structures, in, even in terms of computation, because when you invert these objects, things can, can, can be quite simple. So toplet is nice. It's related to stationarity because if something is stationary, it will have a toplet structure. Okay, that's this invariant structure because you're only depending on the lag t and tau. So does that does, does that tell you what a toplet matrix is? It's a very special matrix and it's intrinsically linked to stationarity. Okay, next. Now this is all good, right? So what we've done is we've defined these notions of conditional stationarity. I mean. Conditional independence, conditional stationarity for time series and so forth. The only problem is, is now in reality, we have to estimate these objects. We have to say, okay, is this object out here a zero? Is this object here toplets? Is this object here toplets? Is it not toplets? We have to do a test. Testing is something toplets, is something zero or not. So we basically, in the end, we're going to have to somehow estimate this 
horrible matrix out here and then try and decide whether this entire matrix is zero or so and so forth. It's a little bit infeasible, okay? Now, another thing you would have learned probably in your statistical studies is if things are sparse, you can estimate them. Okay, it's better than if things are not sparse. So, so far, I've not really talked about sparsity here. What I want to do is if I do a nice transformation, and I hope I can explain that a little bit. I have like eight, nine minutes, right? Okay, if I do a nice transformation, so you're not going to get much to any estimation here. I'm going to tell you the idea of it. If I do a nice transformation, I can go from toplets to sparse matrix. Okay, so that's what I want to explain to you now. Um, so let's start with that. Um, so remember, <coughs> estimating the C matrix, this D, if I want to be fancy operator, turns out to be very, very difficult. Um, but I want to sparsify it. So what I want to do is remember if you have if you have a very if you have a random variable x and it has a variance matrix C, and I basically hit the random variable x with a deterministic matrix, then the transformation matrix A times X is basically A C A, A transpose. What I want to argue is if I hit this matrix D or C with a Fourier matrix, this very special matrix over here. What I'll get is that my toplets matrix will become a diagonal matrix. That, that's essentially what happens. Now, diagonal matrix is a very nice object because basically there are non-zero entries on the diagonal and everything off the diagonal is zero. So I can, it's something I can deal with as, as an object. So going back to my example, this is my, um, and, and now I'm going to, it's easier for me to explain this in the stationary setup and I'll quickly explain if I have any time, but if not, who cares? Um, what it means in the non-stationary setup, okay? okay. And, and then explain to you why this we go into the spectral world, okay? That, that's the idea, right? So this is my stationary system, the VAR model. This is my network out here. I want to show you, if I looked at the variance matrix of this, right? Remember, I'm telling you the variance matrix of this object here is, is infinite dimensional operator matrix, which is P by, it's a four by four block matrix. It will look like this. It will be basically each of those will be toplets. Okay, so remember, I look at this. I'm going to string all time over. I look at the variance of that. It's going to be a toplets matrix. If I hit it with a Fourier matrix on both sides, what I get now is a diagonal matrix, basically. And what does the diagonal matrix look like? I'm a cheating. It's not really a diagonal matrix. It's actually an integral operator, but I don't really worry about that too much. The diagonal here happens to be basically um, the spectral density function I was talking to you about. Okay, so that's where it comes in. So essentially what we're doing is we're getting a toplist matrix, hitting it with a Fourier matrix on both sides. When we do that, we now basically get a diagonal matrix where on the diagonal, we have the spectral density function indexed by omega over that diagonal, okay? Now, what happens is, is that, remember, I'm interested in the inverse of that object, okay? So I have my precision matrix here, I'm actually inverting it. If you remember, there's no connection between three and four and two and three, which tells me, I told you earlier, that means that, that they, they are zeros at the corresponding entries. So it's going to correspond to this matrix out here. Okay, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, and this is zero. Okay, that's my precision matrix now corresponding to it. If I hit it with my Fourier matrix, I basically, these zeros get mapped to zero, so nothing changes, but everything else that's non-zero gets mapped to the spectral density function. This is what we cut, the, the diagonals of this are what we call the inverse spectral density function or the precision spectrum. Okay, and that's this entry. So the entries of this between A and B, so this one over here is now essentially what we, this, the spectral, in terms of the spectral density function. You can show that it's not that hard to do. So in the end, getting my D matrix, my precision matrix, hitting it with my Fourier matrix leads to a diagonal, well, uh, leads to this diagonal, a block diagonal matrix where the blocks over here, over omega, where the blocks over here, this precision matrix out here, this is our precision. So this here, if I go back to what we had, is essentially my omega inverse. And now that tells us why looking for zeros in this matrix basically corresponds to looking for zeros here, which means there's no conditional correlation. Okay. 
I hope that gives you some idea of what's actually happening a little bit in the mathy world. Okay, so that's roughly the mathematics of this. Now what I want to do is turn to the non-stationary setup. Well, why am I interested in going to the Fourier domain? Well, <laughs> I have like three minutes now, right? So I'm thinking how to say this easily. <laughs> if I go into the Fourier domain, I hit it with a Fourier matrix here and I hit it with a Fourier matrix here and something is conditionally non-stationary, I'm not going to have a diagonal matrix anymore. Okay, that, that's what happens in, in the Fourier domain. Fourier is really giving you something very, very sparse, giving you diagonality if it's toplet. If I hit it with a spectral density, with a Fourier matrix on each side, and it's not, um, it's not toplet, that structure is not toplet, which means it's conditionally non-stationary or um, and so forth, I get something that's non-toplet structure. So I miss these two slides out here, and this tells me the following, right? So if so now I'm in the Fourier domain. So we did we made this definition, we showed what that definition means in terms of precision matrices. Now I'm showing you what that definition now means in terms of this transformed precision matrix. Okay. Two nodes are uncorrelated if the matrix corresponding to that is a zero matrix. Two nodes are conditionally stationary, or a node is conditionally stationary if the the if the ma the sub matrix corresponding to that is a diagonal. An edge, uh, there's a there, there's a sort of two things are conditionally stationary if the edge is a toplet matrix. If something is conditionally non-stationary, either like as a node or the edge is conditionally non-stationary, you have a non-toplet matrix. Okay, so now what we have is that the the Fourier version of this quantity over here is this map over here. Okay, zero, 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 because there's no correlation. Diagonal, 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 because these are conditionally stationary. And these are non-diagonal objects if they are, are non-stationary. The only last bit I want to give you is still estimating this object is a little bit difficult. But if we put like conditions on the on the nature of the non-stationarity, something called local stationarity, and that basically tells us that the time series is non-stationary in a global setting, but the dynamics change slowly over time, then even though the corresponding non-stationary matrix, it's, it's hard to show, but you can show it, is going to be um, non-diagonal, the, the non-diagonal is still going to sort of taper away as you move away from that. It's going to very precise decay structure on it. That allows us to sort of estimate this object. We can start using like sort of um, a regulated method to start estimating consistently the S object, okay? And, and, and then you can show nice mathematical properties on that. And that's where I am currently in our research. We've estimated this object, at least in find a small P setting and we have the statistical properties on that. And now our aim, and I don't know how we're gonna do that, is we're gonna try and generalize that to like the large P, which it makes more sense when you have loads and loads of channels in the brain. I'm very sorry if this got too technical and boring for you, but I hope that gives you some idea of how to deal with um, graphs and multi multivariate time series. Thank you very much for your attention. What I do, um, thank you for the great talk and it's very interesting. But uh, at glance, what I would do first is to is if you think that the underlying graph is the identical throughout the tree, then what I do is to just uh, like estimate the uh, the graph first, and then do. I mean, if the if the like uh, running example is like this, if you want to estimate this matching one. This is what I would so I mean my, the more so sort of simplistic way of doing it is you would say okay well let me just um, window my data and then move slowly over time and I have a sort of dynamical graph that would be the simple way of doing it. So no, what I mean is that if your underlying graph is the same, and what I do is just to estimate, I mean estimate uh, the graph by using the whole data, and then by starting starting from that, it'll be more easier if you. Uh, and what do you mean same? So the, 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 the graph structure is the same, right? Over there. I'm confused what you mean by same. 
one, two, three, four. The edge edge structure is the same. What do you mean by same? So throughout the peak, it's the same. You said that it's unchanged. That's what we mean by stationarity. Right. So what I would do is just estimating that that graph. Starting from that, we can easily go go to the uh, covariant uh, condition of covariant yeah, method. But how do you know it is? How do you know? How we can we can estimate it, right? You want to estimate this matter matrix? Yes. yes. Oh, good luck to you. Oh <laughs> uh, no, it's like four four node case, right? Why why would it be so so? I'm talking about over time, right? Over time, yes. Yeah. So well, you you have p p number of variables throughout so, the team, and then yeah, and the time the, series they say ten thousand. They were time series is ten thousand. Yes. So what do you want to estimate? Well, you want to estimate the p number number p node p node of graph, right? P p is the number of yeah. Is it four? The, the so graph it's not. Is not so it's time. What's so that? The, the graph itself is not as a given statement over time. But the structure is the same. So if you just discover the structure first, and then if you want to estimate um, some of the covariant, uh, covariant structure, then it might be the easier. I don't know. Like I don't. I know nothing of the same time series, but I know. So I think what you're describing is contemporaneous structure. You're looking at the variance, and you're looking at the variance over time. That's different. No, what I mean is, so you are, yeah, just a, yeah. I mean, but yeah. I mean, we have a structure where we're looking at like how the dynamics change over time. The entire time series is changing over time. We just said that it's a stationary. It's conditionally stationary. I mean, I'm getting these two things over here, and I'm conditioning on everything else. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's not an easy object to to estimate. Okay. I mean, I, I can, mean, that's why I can talk to you later. Then. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I have a question about. Uh, what is sort of the difference in computational complexity between these sort of uh, Fourier matrix uh, multiplication versus inverting this? Uh, so basically, if you, if um, if it's a good question, what what you gain actually is quite a lot. So um, because it's toplets, when you invert it, you actually use FFT routines to do the inversion usually. Yeah. And so you actually, I think, there are loads of routines if something is toplets to do the inversion, but one routine is to sort of turn it into, go into the frequency domain, inverting that and actually going back. Because um, thanks to stationarity, you can utilize FFT and you can do that computational inverse in N log N. So where something is like N cube, right? And now you're doing it as, in, as N log N, you, you're really gaining. Uh, <clears throat> so when people try to estimate the stationary graph, um, when you go into the Fourier domain, even if um, it's actually relatively straightforward because you use a routine FFT and that's an N log N. It was, so I think this FFT is sort of really classic. It goes apparently back to Gauss, but actually it was, um, so Tuki was the one who, 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 who was really the, the brains behind it. A very general question, neither of your in a real life, our time series usually is a finite time dimension, like a five thousand the time series point. Yeah. And uh, uh, what's the motivation for analyzing the? So you you're not. I mean, in in reality, we're going back to um, we're going we're we're dealing with n-dimensional time series. So everything we're doing now is actually very feasible. Mm -hmm. So our um our matrix now is not infinite dimensional operator. It's basically a, a p by p block matrix where each entry is n by n, a toplet matrix. So, so what we're doing is now actually things math gets a little bit easier, but less elegant in explanation. What we're doing is we're hitting it by FFT matrix. The, exactly what Isaac said. So the FFT matrix, and then that almost diagonalizes. So if you go into finite time, you don't deal with a diagonal matrix anymore. You deal with a matrix which is close to diagonal, but the off diagonal is a very small order. So, so in finite time, it's actually much easier to sort of analyze, and that's everything we're doing. I mean, everything we're doing is finite time, but we have a certain error because we're dealing with finite time. So the diagonal matrix is not a diagonal operator anymore. It actually just turns out to be an almost diagonal matrix. So the entries are um, diagonal, and the off entries are one over n. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.